Good afternoon, and welcome to the City Club of Cleveland. My name is Jan Roller, and I am president of the club. For several years in a row, the National Rifle Association of America has been ranked by members of Congress as the most powerful lobbying organization in the country. It is widely recognized as a major political force and as America's foremost defender of Second Amendment rights. Our speaker today is Wayne LaPierre, Executive Vice President and CEO of the NRA since 1991. He is credited with the most dramatic growth of the organization since it was founded in 1871. It now counts three and a half million members. For you history buffs, it's interesting to know that at the time of its inception, there was a dismay over the lack of marksmanship of our troops. So Union veterans from the Civil War started the organization. Its first president was General Ambrose Burnside. Its eighth president was, its eighth president was President Ulysses S. Grant, and its ninth was General Philip Sher Sheridan. Over the years, the NRA has worked on the protection of hunting, self-defense, firearm education, and safety, and the promotion of firearm ownership rights. In recent years, it has been very active in litigation, legislation, and the political process. In 2005, Mr. LaPierre stated, the Second Amendment is probably in the best shape in this country it's been in in years. He made the comment after the Republican-controlled Congress delivered a long-sought victory to the gun industry to shield firearms manufacturers and dealers from liability lawsuits. And Mr. LaPierre is expecting another big victory soon when the U.S. Supreme Court rules on the case McDonald versus Chicago, a case heard last week in which the NRA was a party. The case challenges handgun bans in the Chicago area, and the NRA is hoping the High Court will hold that the Constitution's right to possess guns limits state and local regulation of firearms. And we all read in the Plain Dealer just yesterday that the Ohio Supreme Court has accepted a similar case which will examine whether Cleveland's home rule provision permits it to impose registration requirements and the right to ban certain weapons. All of this tells us that Mr. LaPierre will be, very, uh, be a very busy man in the coming years as courts determine precisely which gun laws are allowed under the Second Amendment and those which must be stricken. He joined the staff of the NRA back in 1978 and rose through its ranks. He is under the direction of a 76-member board and oversees a staff of 550 employees. He is the NRA's chief spokesman and responsible for implementing the organization's policy. Mr. LaPierre is outspoken and passionate in his effort to protect the Second Amendment. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Wayne LaPierre. Thank you, Dan. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. It's great to be with you today. I really appreciate the chance to be here. It, uh, we, we sure live, live in an interesting time. I, I believe it's, it's a time of, as you do, a time of change. It's a time of challenge. And also, if you look around the country, you see profound public agitation over the future of our nation, if you look at the mood of the public right now. I suspect that like every other American, as you sit here today at lunch, your biggest concerns are probably the economy, our nation's security, health care, and the legacy we leave to our children. So you may be wondering, how does the NRA and the gun debate possibly fit into all of this on what's going on today? I'm here to talk about the fact the NRA, and I believe the battles that we've won and the foes that we've defeated and the ways we've done it are profoundly relevant to what's happening today in our country. As Jan said, I went to work for NRA back in 1978 during the Carter administration. Since then, we've gone through six administrations, more politicians than you can count. They've come and gone. And I keep being asked the same question over and over and over again. Wayne, how did you survive in Washington? How is it that the Second Amendment is stronger than ever? I mean, tell me how the NRA did that. Millions of Americans have seen their firearms rights restored. We now have right to carry, shall issue carry, in 48, 40 states. We have castle doctrine in 24 states. And right to carry reciprocity among states is sweeping the land. How did the NRA do all that? How did the NRA defeat gun bans, ballistic fingerprinting, gun registration, gun owner licensing, 
and two generations worth of anti-gun schemes. And how is it that NRA has gained the trust and support of the American people while becoming the most feared and respected brand of freedom in America? What's the secret of NRA's success? I really believe with all my heart it can be summed up in two simple words, truth and justice. The NRA, over the years, has refused to tell the American public anything but the truth. In big cases and small ones, we've demanded fairness from all Americans. Truth and justice are the reason why so many in positions of power, whether it's in politics or the press, I believe have been abandoned by the American people. And truth and justice is why the NRA has been able to do what we've done. Americans, in their gut, instinctively know the truth. They can smell it. They sense what's right, and they sense what's just. When politicians and the press respect those principles, you see Americans reward them with their votes and viewership and ratings and support. But when they abandon those principles, the American people pull the plug. Now, I'm not here to talk today about deficits or defense, carbon credits, bank bailouts, terrorist trials, or, or health care. But, but I will say this. The leaders we elect to represent us and the media we expect to keep them honest could do a lot more good for their country and their careers if they would simply stop lying. They need to stop telling us things that simply are not true. And let me give you some examples. Last March, everybody, from the White House to Congress to the mainstream media, started saying, and I know you heard it if you turned on your TV or picked up your paper, Mexican drug cartels were arming themselves from guns from the United States. Watch this. 90% of them More than come 90 from America. 90% of the guns recovered in Mexico come from the United States. We're told that 90% of the weapons used by the cartels come from the United States. We need to shut it off. I mean, I got to tell you, when I first heard those sound bites coming out of, of the politicians in Washington, my BS detector immediately bounced off the wall. So I sent an NRA news crew down to talk to the police, to talk to folks, to find out what's going on. Watch this. This so-called Iron River of guns from the United States arms Mexican drug cartels to the teeth. We have seen that nearly 90% of those arms comes from the United States. It's a bunch of crap, a bunch of bull. I mean, it's not... Nowhere even close. It is a numbers game. You only know what they want you to know, or you only know what weapons they want you to trace, for example. But you don't know what you don't know. That's your intelligence gap. And when we press Special Agent Bill Newell of the ATF, even he admitted that is the case. Are they tracing all their firearms? No. There are still a lot of firearms that are being seized in Mexico that are not being traced. They've got Chinese-made weapons. They've got Russian-made. We get weapons from Mexico. Honduras, and El Salvador. I guarantee you cannot go to Walmart and buy some of these grenades or some of these uh, rocket-propelled launchers. Majority of the weapons are not coming from the U.S. One zero six nine. That was also confirmed for us by sheriffs setting up road checks along main arteries used by drug traffickers. I've been sheriff since 1997, January 1st of 97. I've never run into a truckload of guns. But that's not what Senator Dianne Feinstein wanted to hear. From what I hear, it's a lot more than just a few hundred. It really is in the thousands. That's because the senator is scheming with the Obama White House to reinstate a lie of a law, the so-called assault weapons ban, when the time is right. Uh, I have not backed off at all from my belief that uh, the, gun uh, the assault weapons ban made sense. I'll pick the time and the place, no question about that. We're one of the largest police organizations in the country. The minute they started talking about Mexico, I picked up the phone. I started calling the police. Everything they said is, Wayne, they're coming from Central America, Guatemala, China, Russia, the international black arms market. 